Hi, and welcome to episode number 96 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I am Frances Campoy, and I'm here with my colleague, Mark Mandel. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? I am well, Francesc. How are you doing? Currently in the city of Austin, actually. Nice. You're in the city of Austin. I'm in San Francisco, and you're wearing a beautiful Ladies is Gender Neutral t-shirt. I it's, saw that on Twitter, and it's a beautiful t-shirt. I, I am it. wearing that t-shirt. It's my favorite ladies t-shirt. I, I was going to ask how many you have, but you know, that's up to you, so I will not judge. Anyway. Well, <laughs> the, Ladies is Gender t-shirt. Neutral, so all my, all my t-shirts are ladies t-shirts. True. That's a very good point. It's there a very go. good t-shirt. I really like it. <laughs> anyway, we'll have a picture on the show notes. Maybe not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or just follow me on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, so we today we're going to be talking about uh, something quite cool that actually I did not know anything about. Uh, it is Avere, and it's a hybrid file system for the clouds uh, with an S, I'd say. Yeah, we have uh, both Dave and Scott joining us on the show, uh, one Googler and one from Avere, basically talking about how you can build hybrid file systems that span both on-prem and the cloud. It's actually really, really cool. Yeah, very, very interesting episode. And after that, uh, we'll have a question of the week. And the question of the week is, okay, I've heard that Google Cloud Container Builder is cool. How do I get started? Like, is there some tutorial that I could go through? And the answer is actually yes, and we'll answer that later. But before that, we have our cool things of the week. Yes. And we have a lot of them, actually. I'm going to start with the first one, which is something really cool. So we have a new region in South America, and it is in Sao Paulo. So if you're in Brazil, congratulations, because now you have a very, very close to you region. And it is really cool because it's going to be a big thing to celebrate during the Google Cloud Summit in Sao Paulo, which, if I'm not mistaken, is next month. Are you going to be there? No, I will not be uh. there. I Probably not because I have other plans, uh, other trips. But according to this, is November 8th and 9th. So if you have not registered, try to find it. Actually, we'll have a link on the show notes to the registration form. But otherwise, just find Google Cloud Summit Sao Paulo. Awesome. Uh, the second one is one of those things that I just know for how long people have been like, when are you going to have this? When are you going to have this? When are you going to have this? Hmm. Uh, so now we have IPv6 on our global load balancing. It is now GA. Uh, you can nice. go nuts with all your IPv6 needs. So uh, global load balancer is our load balancer that spans the globe which is awesome. So now you can do load balancing for HTTPS, SSL proxy, TCP proxy, all the good things. Pretty excited now that we can finally do all that stuff. Cool, because IPv4, we're running out of IPv4 addresses uh, this year, right? Is it the same time as the year of the Linux on the desktop or is it a different year? Every year is year of the Linux desktop. Every exactly, year. and it's every year we, <laughs> we run out of IPv4. So, Okay, and uh, the next one is about... Cloud Natural Language API, and it is pretty interesting because it's basically the one that allows you to extract knowledge from text, basically. I think it's a decent way of putting it. Yep. And uh, what it's doing now, it's actually able to classify the context of the text. So if you are looking for something and you have the word lobster, right? Lobster, when you're talking about lots, lobster and potatoes, that's probably cooking, but if you talk about lobster and maybe, I don't know, rocks and stuff like that, maybe you're actually talking about biology. So uh, this new feature, what it allows you to do is to extract that context out of the information, which is something very useful. Yeah, it's really cool. We've actually got two articles we're going to talk about here, uh, one of which just sort of goes through uh, the new things. So it's got classifying content. It also has uh, more sentiment analysis on entities. So you can get some cool. ideas about the idea of, of what sort of tone people might be using. Uh, but the second article actually has example code in it. So you can go through and see like results from JSON and uh, how you can interact directly with the API. Uh, so we'll have both of those linked in the show notes. I really like that the example for the context detection is something that I would not be able to reply because I have no idea of uh, American sports, but it says, Rafael Montero shines in Mets victory over the Reds. I have no idea what that means. That's team sports baseball. I have baseball. literally yeah. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> So it is good. Uh, it's a it's an API that is more useful than myself, which is always good. <laughs> awesome. And so finally, last one, Google Cloud Data Prep is now a public beta. So you may have seen the announcement uh, back in March where we announced it as a private beta. But basically, it is a visual way that you can look at 
data stores and, and big data sets so that you may need to clean up or modify or basically be able to look at and do uh, transformations on, but doesn't necessarily require a programmer interface. Uh, so basically for analysts, things like that, who want to be able to do it directly through a UI, it actually looks really cool. Yeah, isn't this what we saw as a solution at some point to show really fancy way of showing billing information? I think it's based on this and BigQuery. I think uh, you're talking about Data Studio, which is the visualization. I keep on mixing those two, and I yep. feel like maybe we should have someone from those teams come and explain that. Absolutely. So, if you're a product manager or an engineer from Cloud Data Prep or Data Studio, please come talk to us. Yes, we would love to have you on the show. Cool. Uh, so... Uh, that was all of the cool things of the week, or actually the cool things of the week that we had time to cover. Yep. And I think it's time to go and talk to our friends from, uh, actually friends from Navier and Google, Dave Elliott and Scott Jeshenek. Sounds good. Let's go do that. Today, I am very excited to have Dave Elliott, uh, developer advocate for Cloud Platform at Google, as well as Scott Jeshenek. Uh, who is the Director of Cloud Products at Avere Systems. Uh, thank you both for joining us. How are you doing today, Scott? Doing great. Thanks for having us. And how are you doing today, Dave? Fantastic. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Have a chat about Avere Systems, the stuff that you build on top of GCP, some of the products you have and how they came about. Uh, but before we get into that, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourselves? Uh, Dave, why don't you go first? Sure. So I'm a developer advocate here with the cloud platform. i uh, been with Google for about four years. My background is uh, storage uh, and networking. And uh, I spend most of my time now working with companies, uh, in particular enterprises that are looking to adopt cloud and, um, you know, in particular looking at uh, adopting cloud and storage solutions. Awesome. Scott, why don't you tell us about yourself? Hi. Uh, so, yeah, I'm the director of product management at Avere, specifically for our cloud products and our software roadmap. Uh, I've got a varied background in IT as well as telecom uh, software products, uh, and most recently uh, at Avere Systems with storage. Cool. So now that we know who you are, uh, let's talk a little bit about Avir. Uh, what is Avir and what do you do? So Avir's around nine years old, eight, nine years old. And, uh, you know, when we originally started the, pro the, the, the product line in the company, it was to address performance and latency issues with network attached storage. So if you were, let's say you were creating a movie uh, and you wanted that movie to be rendered uh, in a certain period of time, and you created a render farm and you have whatever, a thousand servers sitting there. Well, those servers are gonna beat the crap out of your network attached storage, it's inevitable. Especially back then because flash was still really expensive uh, and uh, hard to really come by for those solutions. Uh, over time, we evolved our solution off of our you know, data center product and started adopting cloud technology. Specifically, uh, if you wanted to create, for example, a render farm in the cloud, and you wanted to orchestrate that and run that against some data that's sitting wherever. Uh, Avir provides the technology, uh, the caching technology and data access technology for that. But we also support abstracting a POSIX file system on top of Google Cloud Storage. Uh, so if you have applications that you want to run uh, and you want to put all the data up in the cloud, but you really need those POSIX bits uh, and you need to manage it as you did before, Avir gives you that continuity. So is this just a cloud solution? Is this something you can run on-prem? Like, where does this thing actually sit? Great question. So uh, it can be both. Uh, we have customers today, very large uh, studios in Hollywood that do a lot of rendering, and it's all on-premise. Um, but we have other customers in that space who have started to break up their data center clusters and are looking at uh, you know, running in GCP, uh, a lot of the reason that they want to do that is it's far more flexible. Uh, they don't have to own so much hardware on-prem, uh, especially like a lot of these guys have sort of capped out as to how much they really want to put in a data center. So uh, having GCP, especially being able to take their existing workflows and putting them up there uh, is a real advantage. So we run both on-prem and we ported our appliance into GCE instances that can run in GCE uh, ad adjacent to whatever workload that you're running. Cool. It sounds like it's either on-prem or on Google Cloud. Is that the case? That's right. Or both. You can plug them in both. We're like the Swiss army knife of data access, basically, uh, when it comes to that kind of thing. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a part of the, the beauty of what they offer and how they help our customers uh, approach and, and sort of realize hybrid cloud, right? If you think of the, you, your compute instances in the cloud, your compute instances on-prem, your storage in the cloud, say with GCS, and your storage on-prem, what Avere helps companies do is sort of move between those four entities, those, those four you know, types of compute and storage. We're saying that we are able to have storage that is distributed in between the cloud and on-premise. Uh, does that mean that you're connecting through a VPN? Does everything need to be in the same network? How does this work? Yeah, so great question. So if I were a truly a developer in our team, I would say it depends. Uh, and it depends mm -hmm. on all the variables, right? So typical use case is going to be, we're going to recommend that you're using a gigabit per second link uh, over the network, because a lot of our customer base, they're not doing really small scale stuff. They're doing some pretty serious uploading and processing of data. Uh, so laws of physics, you want to make sure that that data get, gets there as quickly as you can. VPN over the internet is a little tricky because we're then at the mercy of whatever latencies uh, the internet provides. One of the things that our product really strives to do is you know be a killer of latency when it comes to workloads so if we're running a thousand vms in gce i can't afford to have latency bogging down the job uh, and so we typically want to have a a link behind us that is uh, sufficient enough to get as much data into our layer as we can uh, oh and you also asked about network so like from a gce perspective you're going to run the Avere cluster, and we only run clustered. You're going to run that in a, in a subnetwork, uh, not a classic subnetwork, but a regular subnetwork in, in GCE with your with your compute nodes. And does Avere like encrypt the traffic through, or how does what is the security side of things here? Well, so it's twofold. One, if you're using us as a data access layer with your NAS back on prem, so that's that's one of the typical use cases. Is I may have a NetApp or an Isilon environment, and I just need to get to some subset of that data. Uh, we're going to tell you, and we have written this all up in best practices, that you're going to want to secure your link between your data center and the Google network. And it wouldn't matter if you were just using us or if you were using any of the Google services that require that kind of interaction. And we don't encrypt that. We would expect that to be encrypted. But uh, since we also can use GCS as backing storage, um, which is kind of an interesting twist, we, we basically treat GCS as block. We become the NAS for that. That's all SSL encrypted, as well as the data being encrypted at rest. Cool. Uh, so here at the podcast, we are firm believers in open source. Uh, so I'd like to know, is this open source? Is there something that we can check out, the code and stuff? Uh, open source, being a vendor, such a struggle. So, you know, look, uh, I'll tell you what we did do. We, one of the things about our product, since it's clustered, you know, the core the core code itself is proprietary. It's It's because it's highly tuned for caching. Uh, we do a lot of complex read ahead and right behind. I always kind of liken it to like uh, putting rocks in a raging river and trying to steer the data or steer the water in a certain way. It's very difficult to do and you never know what's going to happen downstream. Um, so that's really complicated stuff. But to manage and set up the cluster, especially if you're a developer and you're looking to create like an orchestration pipeline, we created a Python library that we've put up in GitHub. We'll give you the URL to it, it's no problem. And as long as you're able to access uh, our image, which is simple as reaching out to Avere and asking us, uh, we can grant you evaluation access to the, to the code. And this Python library, you, got, you can pick your poison. You can either import it into your Python logic that's fine. And create clusters of our product pointing at your network attached storage back on prem. As long as you have the IP address of the export, you don't even have to, this, this can all be done very easily. And we also created a wrapper Python for that. So basically with one line, you can set up the entire cluster fully configured, ready to go. I, I will say um, from, a, from a Google perspective, you have some options if you're if you're looking at file services. You could use our single node filer. Um, there's some limitations, actually, a fair number of limitations on that. Uh, you could also we support um, cluster. So if you if you truly mm -hmm. are looking for an open source uh, solution, uh, the, some of the challenges there are are really around configuration and management um, of large clusters. Um, or you can use a commercial uh, partner. Avir is um, you, you know our go to partner for these file services. Great. We actually discussed uh, on episode. Let me press remember episode forty. That was a really long time ago. Uh, we interviewed Rodeo FX, and they were talking about how they were using GlusterFS. 
would you say that a veer is kind of like a more managed and all ready to use uh, version of cluster fs what are the differences oh yeah so i'm gonna make it hypothetical even though what i'm saying is directly related to a customer okay <laughs> okay um so we have a customer they're in the render space uh they built with cluster uh, the reason they did it, which is a reason a lot of folks do it, is well, first of all, you know, if you're a developer and, and you're good at what you do, you just want to get to what you need and move on. And that's one of the advantages of open source. Like, go get cluster code and go run it, and I'm done. But it's never as simple as that when you start to introduce it into a complex environment like a render environment where latency is an issue, long-term maintenance is an issue, you're getting chased by angry artists and angry studio people that want you know, the latest scene rendered now, uh, and there's, a, there's an issue with Gluster open source that you can't figure out. Uh, so you, know, you have to take ownership of a lot of stuff there. The question that I always put back, uh, and this will sound salesy for the developers, I apologize, I'm not in sales, is, is that your core business? Is storage and performance of storage your core business? No, it's rendering movies. So the faster you can render a movie, whether you're using commercial products, open source, or a combination of it, uh, the better off for the company. So I, I would say where we're different is, first of all, you can have a cluster of our product up and running in about you know eight, nine minutes using that Python code, ready to go serving ops. You can plug in storage from on-prem, which with cluster, you really kind of can't do that. You can have a mount point, but you're going to be at the mercy of whatever the latencies are of that link. Uh, and then ultimately with Gluster, you know, is it HA? Are you going to have redundant storage and then your costs are going to go up from what you think is going to be a relatively inexpensive solution? Once you start trying to scale it with 500, 600 VMs, uh, you're quickly going to find that Gluster just can't keep up. And you're going to need something, either you're going to have to you know, build on top of Gluster your own custom environment, which again, puts you in a different business, uh, or you look for a commercial provider. Cool. Um, so let's let's swing back around to sort of developer experience and, and how that works. So I'm kind of curious as well. So you said there's a POSIX uh, file system. So does, I've got sort of two questions. One, so this essentially means that I can interact with this once it's all mounted and set up, basically like a local file system, and then you'll handle all the latency. And the other question I'll tack onto that is, does this work in both directions? Can I go from cloud to prem and then prem to cloud? Like, how does that work? Absolutely. So to answer your first question, so from a developer perspective, you know, you have Google Cloud Platform with a lot of fantastic technologies, like the, all the machine learning and TensorFlow and the microservices capabilities. That's all exciting. And it's it's sort of like you're, you're starting to think about how can I develop with all these new tools and what value can I drive in the company for, you know, to with these new tools. And that's great. And that's your next cycle. That's what you're building towards. But then you have this whole host of applications today. And I'm going to exclude database applications just because if I were using a relational database, uh, I'd go put it up in Google's relational database product and be done with it uh, just to make my life simpler. Um, but let's just think about file-based applications that you have. So let's say they're business, you know, mission critical, can't really tear them down and reauthor them. They're six, seven years old and they've just been working. Do you really want to break that? Well, you know, why do that? Uh, just go run it up in Google, uh, run it on some VMs or some containers, and we just present a mount point. So you just mount that export and, and you're ready to go. That's the easiest way to look at it from a developer's perspective is, do I want to spend time rewriting a lot of things that I don't need to and therefore delay my entry into cloud um, because of all of that? Or do I want to just, I'll, I'll slam them up there into the cloud, use the exports through the Avir, and then I can go work on these other new and interesting things while that stuff's just doing what it used to do. And to the second question, which is, can I go in both directions? Thanks for reminding me about the second question, which I totally <laughs> forgot about. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, if you let's say you're using our physical appliance. What are the use cases with our product, uh, especially in life sciences? So, like, all the genetic sequencing uh, companies, they're creating they're creating amazing amounts of data, petabytes of data. They, they got to put it somewhere. And so they're all looking at putting it up into places like Google Cloud Storage. But the problem that they all run into, uh, especially in that particular space, is all their pipeline applications. Everything they use to do alignment and, and uh, variant analysis and everything, they're all file-based. People are rewriting some of them, but it's the same problem again. Uh, is that my day job? Do I have time to stop people 
using the classic tool to get this new tool and then I have to spend six months debugging it? Um, or can I just put this stuff up there? And so Veer will allow you to put it into Google Cloud Storage, but we put it there in a way that allows you to see it as POSIX. And when I say POSIX, it means a directory structure, the standard POSIX bits, uh, and uh, we also do it in a sharded way so that you don't have to worry about uh, multi-part gets and puts uh, or having to get the entire file out of Google and pay the egress charge. Cool. So I don't know if it's my jet lag or it's just like I missed something, but I'm curious about where do you actually store this information? Is it stored in GC instances? Is it stored in cloud storage and persistent disks? Uh, where does this information actually live at the end? It is not your jet lag. It's a completely legitimate <laughs> question everybody asks us. So one of the things to think of us as, and when people ask us what we really do, I say we, we basically facilitate access to data and we do it at a high performance level, all right? The data itself resides on your NAS. It resides in your GCS bucket. The only data that resides on a Veer is any data that has been requested by clients for the latest job. So it's basically a cache. We also leverage mm. local SSD technology uh, in Google, which, by the way, I mean, Google's local SSD facility is fantastic. We get great performance out of it. We also do support the persistent uh, SSDs, but uh, you get an upper bound of uh, throughput on the persistent SSDs. So if we want to max out performance, we use local. Um, but again, yeah, uh, it's only transient data. It goes away when you're done. Yeah, I'll, I'll say, you know, of your systems, they, these are file system experts, and the caching algorithms that they've developed you know, over their seven years are unbelievable, best of breed or best around. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's a, it's a scenario of, of, you know, because they've got these, these, these fantastic caching algorithms, it makes uh, latency and performance uh, just that much better. Cool. So my next question is, since Mark was asking about the directions of the mappings and if I can basically get like Google Cloud Storage as a POSIX systems on my instance, uh, can I also map the same folders multi into multiple instances like is like multi read multi write yes is a veer a good way of communicating across many different uh, machines or is it more a place where you basically just use it to store stuff uh, that is being used by one single worker ah good question the sweet spot use case if you think about it is i'm going to run a render farm i'm going to run a post sequencing genomic analysis to like cure some disease uh, I'm going to do a, a Monte Carlo simulation in financial services so I can squeeze more money out of my fund. Those are all things that run thousands of machines. And typically, those machines are going to come up and they're going to all read some sort of common set of data. And that is tailor-made for caching. So our where we really shine in terms of technology is if you have an HPC cluster or a compute environment and you've got a lot of nodes demanding data from some storage that is simply not going to be able to keep up with it. We do support writing the data out, so you can do your render and then write out your, your results. And we cache those writes as well, and that gives you performance on that side of it. From the sort of single client accessing a folder kind of use case that you mentioned, that's really like the the domain of something like a single node. I mean, it just depends on on how you're going to use that particular technology. It's not that we can't support a single client doing it. It's just that we're really built for the, the high performance space. Just to dig a little bit deeper, let's imagine that we have, as you were saying, a lot of workers that are actually within the same piece of data. And then somehow there's another worker that updates that. What you're saying is that you're going to manage the caching validation across all of the places where that information might have been cached, and that will be transparent to the user. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, that's within one of our clusters. So a cluster can be three nodes, and that three-node cluster can service, I don't know, 500 and one high mem fours or high mem 8s. So it's not a small environment. Uh, but you can run... 20 nodes, 23 nodes, 24 nodes of our system. And that is a tremendously large scale operation that you'd be running there, 65, 70,000 cores. But every write gets cached and every read gets cached for all the clients. And the writes are always protected. So if, if somebody writes something and somebody else wants to read it, they're going to read the latest. Um, if somebody tries to write on that, 
right, then that, that'll all be tracked and modified and, and updated ac- accordingly. Cool. I have no idea what the answer to this question is going to be, but I'm curious. So if we're big fans of Kubernetes, and it's been a hot topic about how to store data inside particular containers and Kubernetes. Is there a plugin or a, basically a way for using a very technology to do like persistent volume claims or basically store lots of data so you can do like HPC workloads on Kubernetes? Yeah, I mean, so I, I looked into this. I also looked into Hadoop, right? And if you're not, just to diverge for one second from Kubernetes, if you're using Hadoop and you're not married to HBase and other like HQuery uh, as part of your sort of tool chain, and you'd be able to use your Hadoop job as a file-based job, you can actually do something I call hybrid Hadoop, which is basically run a Hadoop cluster in GCE, use the Veer access layer against your NetApp. On Kubernetes, I mean, I'm a little torn because in terms of Kubernetes, if if you have a tiny, small data slice and you're a very sophisticated developer and you're able to place that little slice of data just, just so in each container, you know, uh, you know, that's really fine. I mean, you can go ahead and use that. But if you want, you can use Kubernetes containers with an export, with an NFS export mount point. So there's no reason why you couldn't bring up lots of containers pointing at a export and consume the data from that export uh, just as you... Yeah. So that's actually, you hit the hit the lead there a little. So you also not only got your own sort of maybe Fuse technology or something like that, but you expose it as something like NFS or other standard sort of file mounting solutions so that if you have existing tools, it's super easy to just get those up and running with uh, Avir. Yeah, actually, you just raised a critical point too. This is not Fuse. So Fuse is a little tricky because it's user space. Uh, it's got an upper bound of performance. If you just need to do some basic stuff with Fuse, I'm never going to argue against it, but... It's, it's not really meant for high-performance, sophisticated workloads. Uh, it is, you know, the stuff we wrote is grounded in very, very fundamental code that I, you know, unless we all mutually assign some NDA, I can't really say what it is, but uh, whatever. <laughs> No, it's, yeah, it sounded like you have like an NFS mount. Yeah. Basically, standard file sharing type protocols seem to be supported by Avir. Yeah, so the front end of our product basically presents NFS or SIFs. And if you're using GCS object as the backing storage for it, it can actually support multi-protocol out the front. And it integrates with so, Active Directory and everything else. So, so yeah, Mark, maybe we, we did bury the lead a little bit on there. Really, the two use cases we, we really talk about um, with Avira, one is this, this killer of latency. Um, because they've got the great caching algorithms, but the second is is really that translation layer, right? For 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 folks who 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 want to use those those file based services, you know, who rely on NFS or SMB um, to be able to 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 begin to move to to our cloud. And just as a side note, some small uh, render farms uh, and studios, uh, their their workflows are based on SMB SIFs, uh, and so that you know we give them that luxury of using that as well. Cool. Uh, so now I'm curious a little bit about whether you can talk about some of your customers or cool use cases that you've seen. What kind of use cases we mentioned rendering? What are the things you've seen that were powered by Avir? Sure. Um, so taking it along the same line as uh, anybody with a lot of need to read a lot of common data at a low latency, we have a lot of interesting use cases in, you know, uh, I always say like Hollywood health and hedge funds. For some reason, those are really sweet spots for us. <laughs> but we also work in the oil and gas space. So you got a lot of uh, geologic analysis surveys that are very read intensive. Uh, you'll hear me emphasize read, but uh, just so that I'm clear, we also have ingest use cases. So, uh, for example, um, somebody I cannot possibly name nor ever will name uh, somewhere in the eastern part of this country uh takes a lot of pictures and those pictures are being stored in very deep storage uh, and that ingest has to happen at a certain high rate and we're talking about larger files here so that it's clear um, and so uh, you know especially on our physical product we do a lot of write caching and we have NVRAM cards built into our hardware so we're able to more quickly ingest and acknowledge uh, those those writes uh, quickly. And, and that's another important point from a developer's perspective. If you have a pipeline that depends on receiving an ACK 
uh, from the protocol level, uh, Avir does the act immediately uh, after receiving the right and caches that right uh, across partners. So um, let's see, video ingest, transcoding of video, rendering farms, bioinformatics, name it. I mean, pharmaceutical, uh, biological analysis, those are all places that we play. And we also sell to colleges. Right. And, and the, the combination of, of being able to leverage things like, on the compute side, preemptible VMs, you, you, the, the, the cost of you know, spinning up thousands of cores and using them for you know, rendering or for you know, hedge fund trading or things like that, you know, simulations, it, it, it really is a game changer. Uh, that, that really is, um, you know, I would say, probably the single biggest you know, killer use case. It's that, it's that, that the latency killer um, and e- enabling uh, GCE compute instances that are you know, wildly, wildly scalable, you know, highly available, um, and super, super low cost. Um, that's where it becomes, you know, super, super interesting. Cool. So we're kind of running out of time, but I had one last question, which is, what's the best way to get started? www.averesystems.com. You can always reach out to me. My contact information is probably going to be posted, uh, and I can put you, you in touch with. But yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and I can put you in touch with the right folks. But it's it's really not that difficult to get started uh, with the cluster, and uh, you can go out to GitHub today and get the uh, the Python library and and have a look at what we're doing and what we base it on. And that's that's the easiest way. And is there anything we haven't managed to cover? You want to plug any events or any special stuff that you think we the, our listeners should know about Avir? Uh, you know, probably the next place that we're going to be uh, is at the Google Summit on September 27th in Chicago. Uh, I will actually be uh, taking on booth duty, so feel free to stop by the booth and uh, we can certainly talk. And and I'll just add that Avira Systems actually was the GCP Technology Partner of the Year a couple of years ago, and we have ongoing engineering alignment, um, so you'll see... Uh, better and better and better solutions uh, with the two of us as we as we go forward. That was your wink and nudge, right? <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, to both Dave and Scott for taking the time today to talk about, about Avir and all the cool things people are building with it. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much again to both Dave and Scott for such an interesting interview. I hope it was fair for me to ask about GlasRFS, but I feel like it is really interesting that there's so many different options to provide f- file systems that are over the cloud plus like your own computers, and and it's uh, you know it's important to be to be able to make the difference and you know love the answer. Yeah, no, super super interesting stuff. Same thing again, like being able to scale both your compute and your storage across on-prem and cloud. I think is. Very impressive and also highly useful for a bunch of workloads. Yeah, and I'm going to do a shameless plug for ourselves and uh, <laughs> say that if you want to learn a little bit more about similar use cases, we interviewed Brodeo FX. She's the visual effects studio that does really fancy things, among other things. They do things for Game of Thrones and Deadpool and stuff. Mm-hmm. And they talk a little bit about how they use the cloud plus their premise. And they do use GlusterFS. They do not use Avir. But uh, it is still a very interesting use case. So if you want to check that out, it was episode 40, long time ago. That was in 2016. Awesome. Yeah, definitely check that out. That was a great episode. So why don't we get stuck into our question of the week? Uh, You set things up nicely, but I know you have good answers. Uh, So we were talking about Container Builder. Basically, I want to build some stuff in the cloud using Container Builder, uh, but I don't know anything about it. Like, where do I get started? What can I do to learn more about this thing? It seems really cool. Yeah, so the the question was really cool because the question actually comes from someone yesterday at the Go Meetup uh, that took place in the Docker office here in San Francisco. Nice. And they were talking about the newest features of Docker and one of the cool things that are that are coming but still not in uh, the the stable release is multi-stage builders. And multi-stage builders are super cool because they allow you to basically do the typical things we do them with a make file, which is you you use a container with all of your compilers and all the developing tools. And then out of that, you generate a binary that then you put in a different container. 
And normally you, we used to do that with a make file. At least I'm sure that you, Mark, did I it with a make file. I would definitely do this with a make file. Yes, yes. For sure. <laughs> so now you can do that with uh, just one Docker file, which is very useful. And they asked me, like, so how do you use this? Like, did you upgrade to the latest version? And my answer was like, actually, no. Actually, you can use this directly on Container Builder, which is super cool. Because first of all, you don't make your machine work too much because the building process itself will happen in the cloud. But also you get the newest features of Docker before they're actually unstable because they basically pick the best features in order to have them there so you can experiment with them which is really cool so the question after that was okay cool how do I use this right how do I get started and of course the first answer is read the docs like <laughs> read yeah. the manual and we'll have a link to the docs but if I'm not mistaken is cloud.google.com slash container dash builder but anyway uh, we'll have a link in the show notes the second thing that you can do, and it's the second shameless plug of the, of the episode, is that we actually did an episode uh, with Christopher Sensen and David Bendore, which is which are a product manager and one of the develop uh, one of the software engineers in the Container Builder team, where they told us everything about Container Builder, and that was on episode seventy nine. Now the thing I did not know that I discovered because someone sent it to me via Twitter was that our dear friend and coworker Carter Morgan has a series on YouTube about Container Builder. No. And there's two videos already, and they're really good. The first one is basically an intro to Container Builder plus how to do cloud rolling updates directly for Container Builder, which is super useful. And the second one is on how to use not multi-stage builds, but multi-step builds, which is not exactly oh, cool. the same thing. Yeah, it's not exactly the same thing. It's basically more like when you want to do go vet and go test and then go build and then send that to a container and then that container should be deployed somewhere else, right? Like those are multiple steps that are not necessarily related to Docker. Yep. Multi-stage build is inside of a Docker file. So not completely the same, but very related. Nice. No, I really, I love Container Builder. For, for a long time, I was kind of confused about it. I thought it was a thing to build containers, but then I realized it is actually a thing that builds things with containers. Yeah. Which is a, a flipping mental thought, yeah? <laughs> Slightly ambiguous naming, yes. Yes. But great product, nonetheless. <laughs> Excellent. All right, well, before we wrap up, Francesc, are you going anywhere, doing anything interesting? Is there a Just for Funk we should know about? Uh, so by the time this comes out, there will be a Chess on Funk that will come out on the 25th. And also on that day, I will be flying to Chicago because on the 27th, I will be speaking at Cloud Summit Chicago and I will be presenting about TensorFlow. Nice. Very excited about that. Uh, yeah, and after that, uh, as I said before, there's going to be a bunch of events. I'll be Velocity London. I'll be at Cloud Summit in Paris and I'll be in Nantes. All of that the same day, basically. <laughs> I'll be there from basically October 17th to the 20th. Uh, there's going to be four days where I'm going to be speaking every single day in a different city. Nice. Fun. Yep. What about you? Uh, when this episode comes out, I will be actually actually on, on a plane going to St. Louis for Strange Loop. So I'll be hanging out there. If anyone else is also going and wants to say hi, please come up and say hello. Um, then in October, I will also be going over to Australia as you've just got back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I will be speaking at DevFest Melbourne. I will be speaking at GCAP Asia Pacific. I'll be hanging out at PAX. I'll be hanging out at Unite. Um, I do have some days free. So if any people who are listening and from Melbourne and they want to get together and talk about cloud or games or games in cloud or any of that sort of stuff, please feel free to reach out and ping me. I will be more than happy to hang out with you, have a coffee. Cool. Down to Melbourne things. Yeah, uh, I know that Google Developer Group Cloud in Melbourne will be happy to have you. But I will let them find you. <laughs> I think it's it's been a while that we have not done this. So uh, why don't we remind our dear listeners how to get in touch with us so they can send us cool things of the week or questions of the week or just like uh, random brands or saying that, that, that they love us and we're amazing. Also, we accept that kind of critic. Yeah, sounds good. You can ask the questions. I'll, I'll fill in the Okay, blanks. yeah, because I yeah the Slack, I will never get it ever. <laughs> so let's start with Twitter. It's at GCP Podcast. We are also on Google Plus. At Plus GCP Podcast. We do have a webpage. It's gcppodcast.com or cloud.google.com slash podcast. And we also have an email. Hello at gcppodcast.com. We are on Reddit. Slash R slash GCP Podcast. And last but not least, we're on Slack. At the hash podcast channel in bit.ly slash GCP dash Slack. 
And someone mentioned at some point, we are the only podcast that doesn't say, please rate us on iTunes or subscribe or whatever. So please do that too. Yeah, please subscribe. That would be <laughs> yeah. good. Yeah, I don't know. Please subscribe and leave like good reviews and stuff. Uh, apparently it's important. So yep. please do it. <laughs> yes, please like subscribe and stuff. I don't know. I feel kind of weird saying that. But anyway, that sounds, that know. would be great. Send we love messages. all of you. Please do the nice things. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, friends. Awesome. Thank you once again for another episode. Thank you, Mark. And thank you all for listening. And we'll see you all next week. 